The thing, the whole thing of blues guitar playing was what set me off to want to be a, a guitar player. I'd, I'd heard the guitar used in folk music, I'd heard the guitar used in country music, but then my eldest brother, had, you know, he filled the house with rock and roll. My middle brother got into the blues, and so all of a sudden I was listening to, there was one particular Big Bill Brunsey record which was live in, in Sweden. And Brunsey, of course, played in standard tuning. But th there was such fluidity in what he did that I, I, was, I, was, I literally can still remember just sitting there hearing it and just thinking, that is inconceivable. I have no idea what's going on, but I want to be able to do that in whatever sense you do that. And, and so I... Um, I just got into the whole thing of, of listening to blues records. And at that point, this was, you know, um, mid and late 60s, the reissues were coming out thick and fast. And so um, when I was 14, which would have been 1967, there's a Sam Charters record called The Country Blues, which uh, it belonged to a friend of mine and I borrowed it and I still have it actually but that record had it had uh, again Brunsey on it but it had Blind Willie Johnson, Blind Willie McTell, Robert Johnson all these astonishing ridiculous performances from 78s and again I just I sat and I listened and I listened and I listened at the time I think I had a classical guitar you know and then I got a steel string guitar and the first thing that I did was go to an open tuning, you know, and in this case it would have been G major or D major, probably first off D major and of course D major is beautiful just that is beautiful and the thing about it is all, all these tunings I think dictate to you and that's one of the first things that I learned okay if you've got D tuning you've got that thing there and you've got that linear scale and you've got it there and you've got it there as well <clears throat> all that stuff and if you put a slide on then you've got woodly 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 woo woo and you know the, the Elmo James kind of thing um, and I, I learned to do that a lot you know and play these all that kind of stuff which <clears throat> it's so much the dictation of the tuning. Um, I'm going to just kind of sideline a bit because um, what I did really quite early on was decide that I didn't want to be dictated to by the tunings because, you know, cliche, I think, is a very good, important element of playing. You know, we, we all... A cliché becomes a cliché because it's really good, because it's really accessible and it's really good. But there comes a point where you don't want to be doing clichés. Recently I got a vintage guitar and I'm used to playing these modern guitars which can low tune and they're really powerful and 
and this was a really light, beautiful guitar, and it wanted to be in this tuning. It wanted to be in D major, and I hadn't played in D major, certainly hadn't written in D major, probably for 25 years. And I got the guitar, and it made me write these two songs, which are on the new record, which are absolutely following the dictation of D major tuning. You know, it's kind of And I mean, it doesn't sound very bluesy, but but this kind of this is going right back to the first stuff that I ever did, playing in D major and playing blues. You know, that's uh, it's rambling on my mind, basically. I think with Robert Johnson. So what I did was explored all that and stole massively from, from everybody that I could steal from. Um, if I go back to G. I've got a lot of these delta things in G all the slide things in G, you know, very much. The dictation. Let's just see. I haven't played slide on this guitar before. It'd be a bit light. under the hand it's so completely right well it tells you what to do and I think it's great I think it's marvelous but again at a certain point I just went okay I don't want to sound like that I want something else out of this instrument and I've always played the banjo and of course the banjo I think is the proto blues instrument and my theory <laughs> which is mine is that the banjo because it was a homemade instrument fretless instrument very often it's incredibly hard to intonate. So you tune it to get as many notes from the scale as you could on open strings. So you've got a minor pentatonic. There, so that's a G sus tuning. And if you listen to a lot of the old time banjo players, playing things like the cuckoo bird, they'd be playing in this tuning. It's a, a modal tuning, it's a suspended fourth, there isn't a major, there isn't a minor, and immediately, well that's cool for the blues because, you know, blues has both or neither, and, and this just began to be a source of complete fascination for me because you can't just go blah with a slide, you know, you've got to actually Thing. I mean, I was very fortunate in that I went to a folk club basically immediately after I got my first guitar. And it was round the corner from where I lived. It was in the Good Companions Hut, which was a, a wartime Nissan hut on East Common Lane in Scunthorpe, you know. Tuesday nights, sixpence to get in, unlicensed. And I went there with a head full of everything. And, and, and everything that I saw just contributed. And I never felt, I honestly never felt that there was very much distance at all between old-timey ballads on the banjo 
and blues and English and Scots and Irish traditional music. It just all felt like places on the palette. And uh, peop people, I used to hear, you make up your mind, you've got to make up your mind what you want to do, you know, you can't do it all. And, in, and I was just going, well, actually, why not? It's all the same stuff. You know, if I get good at playing that aspect, you know, banjo playing, it's going to contribute to this aspect. If I get good at playing the blues, you know, and, and figuring out how to make one note sound really good, it's going to be great for playing slow airs on the guitar. It all, it's all the same kind of thing. And, uh, and, you know, people would say, you can't do that. And so I would say, well, okay then. And inside, this part of me would be saying, what you mean is, you can't do that. You know, so I'm going to do it. Thank you very much. And I went to live in the States. And it ju I just, I mean, I always joke about it, but I always say to people, well, I got to the States and I realized that I'd invented American traditional music, you know, because I'd combined English and Scottish and African American stuff and done it all, you know, and that's what American folk music is. It's all this stuff mashed up, all these techniques thrown in together. Why, why can't you do it all? Because it is just different ends of the same thing. If you, if you look at the ballad tradition, you know, the, this huge tradition of singing the, the Scottish, English and Scottish traditional ballads. Um, and then you go and listen to Sonny Boy Williamson recordings, you know, from the late 50s, early 60s. And there's Sonny Boy Williamson singing, I come home last night just as drunk as I can be and there's a head on my pillow where my head is supposed to be. And it's just, it's a version of a, an 18th century Scots ballad on it, you know, cranked away Chicago blues style, magnificent. So that kind of stuff just always, always informed me that all this stuff that you do, it's all, you could, you're allowed to take from wherever. And if you want, and you want to make it your, your own, you want your own voice, so, it just was, I, that's what I wanted. I, I was either too lazy to learn very much stuff exactly like other people did it, or else, you know, I seriously, and I still don't understand, I, I had an obstinacy, I was massively driven. I went to see um, a Lippmann Rao blues package when I was 15. We went in a coach from Scunthorpe to, uh, to Manchester Free Trade Hall, and it was, uh, John Lee Hooker and Jimmy Reed, T-Bone Walker, Big Joe Williams, Big Walter Horton, and various other people, you know. It was an absolute mind exploder. And at the end of the gig, all the guys were tr assembling the bus to go home, and they went, where's Simpson? And I was in the dressing room hanging out because, because I knew that I should be, because I knew that that's, you know, I knew that I would be learning, so. <laughs> Where's it now? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Long come Brady in his electric car. He got a mean look right in his eye. He gonna shoot somebody just to see him die. Been on the job too long. And Lord Duncan, Duncan, he was tending the bar. And up come Brady with his shine and the star. Brady he said, Duncan boy, you under arrest. Well now Duncan shot a hole right in Brady's chest. Been on the job too long. It's G sus4, but with the D in the bass instead of the C. Because it doesn't really, it doesn't have, it's much more wants to go back, you know, it has a big thing about the five chord. It's all five chord now. Back to one. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Um, my basic right hand position is thumb on the basses and then a finger per string. I mean, that's where I start. So it's a three finger, very flat wrist. So that opening phrase, you see, it's exactly what's happening. It's a pinch with the thumb and third finger. And then works, works its way back. So I am ending, ending up using all three fingers and the thumb in the first phrase. Um, I spent a, a very long time learning to do that, you know. And one of the things that I learned is it's actually much more interesting not to always do that, but to break it up. And this would be a good example of that. So that, you know, it's reliant on the fact that you have to be able to alternate the bass, but then there's all kinds of uh, different, rather than just go ink ching ink ching ink ching ink ching It's got these little bass fills and stuff which break it all up. That kind of thing, you know. It's, so it's, it's a series of linked melodic statements in its way, uh, but it is... percussive spits as well in there and they're all done with the back of that finger you know really kind of little hammer sort of uh, thing which I'll, I'll talk about I'll illustrate it a bit a bit more clearly <laughs> When I was a kid, started to play, there were no PAs in folk clubs. And so the people I could hear play the guitar, they all wore finger picks. Pe actually, you know, people who aren't with us anymore, um, but there's a guy called Derek Brimston who was on the folk scene, who was a, one of the funniest men on the planet. But he was a brilliant comedian, he really was, but he was also a deadly serious guitar and banjo player. And he played with a thumb pick and two finger picks, you know. So I'd go, uh -huh. and then you'd get guys like Stefan Grossman come across, and you know he used finger picks a lot. Again, you know, no PA system, so he was he was making a lot of noise to be heard, but also reproducing sounds that you know black street musicians had used in order to be heard. And, and uh, so I started playing with a thumb pick and finger picks, and then I got a banjo, and I had no idea about claw hammer or anything. I wanted to be Earl Scruggs for about five minutes until I discovered that in order to be Earl Scruggs, you really needed a bluegrass band. You know, you really needed somebody playing a backbeat to make any sense of what he was doing. But meanwhile, you know, I'd learned to use a thumb pick and two finger picks three finger picks actually a lot of the time and then what happened was that I discovered all this stuff that you can do with the backs of your nails so claw hammer banjo and the kind of really that kind of sound that you know can't do that with finger picks you'd put your eye out <laughs> so so I took the finger picks off but by that time, I developed this hand position, which was, you know, very flat with the thumb parallel to the strings, played with the thumb pick, and I just stayed with it.
good technique, really. You know, it really just it's, it's so economical to play like that. So, and sometimes I take it off and you know play around with 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 a bare some. And of course, when I frail a banjo, I have to do that. But it, I'm just so used to being articulate with a sum pick. That's the thing. So this guitar uh, is. tuned in a C tuning, so if I kind of introduce the idea of what it is to start with. Um, it's root fifth root, again. I've got it capoed at the second fret because of, because of singing, basically, so um, it's in the key of D. But the tuning is root fifth root fourth root ninth. So I, I discovered this by accident and I really, really thought it, it was on my birthday. I was staying with a friend in Florida and I went, oh, it's my birthday present to myself. It's this, this is great. Nobody's ever done this before. And of course, whenever you think that, you immediately discover that it's an old timey banjo tuning that, that some toothless character in Kentucky came up with a long time before you were born. <laughs> The other thing about this tuning is, in fact, it's incredibly close to standard tuning. So it's like playing in drop D or dad gad, but then you've got the root there. So you've got this perfect places to play blues licks. this kind of thing. And that's where the open strings come in. So you've suddenly, you've armed yourself with this extraordinary atmosphere. And it's, it's so easy to do, you know. and chordality, you know. So how would you do a, a fairly straight blues? In um, I'll play you um, a verse of St. James Infirmary blues in this tuning too, because I think it's a good example of how this tuning works and how, how it, it gives you a set of tonalities that would be massively harder to, to achieve in standard tuning. Now I've got to just remember it again. Yeah, but it 